Hi, everybody, and welcome to Health Matters. This is going to be an incredibly cool episode. We're going to talk about stuff that may, well, blow your mind. We're going to talk about a topic as cool as what makes us human. Why are humans different than other primates? I mean, that's pretty neat stuff. To do this, we needed somebody who was as cool as the topic and as brilliant as the topic, and we have. Welcome to our show. This is Dr. Alison Mawatri. Yeah. Did I get it? Yeah, you right. got it right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thanks for hosting me, by the way. <laughs> My pleasure. Um, Dr. Mawatri is professor in the Department of Pediatrics and uh, uh, Cellular and Molecular Medicine and is co-director of the Stem Cell Program and the Stem Cell uh, Lab at the Sanford Consortium. Right. I want to make sure I get it all in to get this right. Um, you, you know, what is it that makes us uniquely human? Yeah. I spotted that on your website and I thought that's got to be the opening for the show. <laughs> so tell us. What, <laughs> yeah. I know you know the answer now. I, to be honest, I actually don't know the answer <laughs> okay. because the more we think that we as humans are different from other primates, uh, the more we realize how similar we, we are. Um, so you name anything that people in the past have been uh, trying to classify as human specific, for example, um, use of um, tools. And now even birds, we know that they use tools uh, to catch uh, food or, or anything else like that. So, um, so what makes us human um, becomes very complex. Uh, but I came from a neuroscience perspective, and what I see is that the human brain is really different from any other species. And this is uh, related to our social capability. And what I, what I mean by social capability is um, how our brain has the computational power uh, to deal with other members of our species. If you take the chimpanzees, our closest relatives, they can deal with 50 other members in the community. If the colony grows bigger, there's a stress. Somebody will fight and somebody will have to leave the colony. We as humans, uh, we develop or evolve our frontal cortex so we can deal with 150. So it's three times more the capacity of dealing with members at the same time. So this high social capacity allow us to grow in big communities, allow us to evolve in cities, allow us to use uh, collaboration to develop technology. And that's why you don't see a chimp going to space, you, you see uh, humans walking in the moon. So this is uniquely human. And you've looked at the Neanderthal DNA and said their brains weren't the same as ours, and one of the differences was how the brain is structured. Yeah, um, uh, for um, several years, uh, the only information we, we had about uh, the Neanderthals or, or other humans that were now extinct was through the fossil records. Um, so these are uh, endocasts that you can extrapolate information by analyzing how the brain will probably grow inside the skull, and the skull is the bone that you can collect from the fossil record. Um, so in my lab, we are doing something else. We are doing like a genomic comparison between the DNA that can be isolated from these bone fossil records and compared to modern humans. And we ask the following questions. Um, what are the unique genetic variants that we have and the Neanderthals don't have? How different we are from them? And once we map these genetic variants, uh, can we design experimental assays to prove that these genetic variants are important or not. So um, my lab has been using genome editing. I'm, I'm just, it sounds like science fiction. <laughs> I mean, it, seriously, it sounds like this shouldn't be, I mean, that's, that sounds like you, you read it in a story somewhere. It's incredible that you have the technology to do this right, right now, right, right here. Right, right. This is, uh, this is happening. This is uh, one of uh, the frontier, the cutting edge of science. And, um, and we can use uh, genome editing technologies now to reinsert ancestral DNA inside uh, our living cells and, and see how the cells change or how brain organoids will change their behavior. So that's what's going on right now. Well, you, you dropped it in a sentence, brain organoids, and now we have to explain what that is. But what we're going to start off with talking about is that the structure of the brain mm -hmm. helps decide how it functions, like the structure of a computer circuitry might affect it. And, and how do we get that structure? How does it ever come about? I mean, we just grow. Right. So how do we end up with a structure at all? Yeah, so this is one of, um, again, I mean, biggest uh, questions and challenges from human embryogenesis. 
how from the clusters of cells from your blastocyst, how come some of these cells will become your nervous system and will form uh, uh, your frontal cortex, which is one of the most complex tissues in the entire universe. Um, and so this is a, um, um, uh, we don't know. And, and part of the problem is the fact that we don't have experimental access to the human embryo being, being formed inside the uterus. So it's unethical to do an experiment with a healthy uh, human baby brain. Right. Um, so for several years, scientists have li relying on animal models, for example. We try to learn what happens in, uh, in a mouse or in a monkey, and we extrapolate to humans. But as I pointed out, the human brain is so different from other species, um, so we need to understand how the human brain is formed. So here comes this new uh, technology, which is uh, uh, a brain organoid. And a brain organoid is just the recapitulation of the human development inside uh, the lab, um, using stem cells to grow every single step at these very early stages of neurodevelopment. Let's explain what stem cells are, so this will make sense. All right. Stem cells are cells that are immature. They don't have a, a fate. Uh, defined yet. For example, in, 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 you have your skin cells, you have your blood cells, you have your brain cells. All these cells have names right now because they already acquire some kind of identity. In the early stages of uh, uh, the embryogenesis, you have uh, stem cells that um, are not defined yet. They are just uh, self-replicating and they will give rise to progenitor cells that later will form all the tissues in the body. So these cells, we call them pluripotent stem cells because they can form any tissues of the body. So if they're given the right instructions or stimulus, they could become liver or brain. Right, You don't right. know, so you figured out how to induce them to becoming brain. Yeah, we are brain makers. <laughs> we, we develop uh, protocols and, and, and recipes, formulas, that we can uh, add on these stem cells uh, and instruct them or, or fool them around to think that they are in the right environment to become the cell type that we want. And my lab has been optimizing these protocols to create what we call a brain organoid or a mini brain. Some people call them mini brains because they're just a, a very miniaturized version of the human brain. And what do you learn from that? Um, we, in the beginning, we were learning uh, what are the molecular and cellular alterations that happens at these very early stages. And we could use these tools uh, to learn more about um, uh, what happens when the brain has uh, suffered a major alterations. For example, our work with the Zika virus. We have a virus and we have a microcephalic outbreak in the northeast of Brazil. Is it uh, caused by the virus or, or not? Uh, so to prove causation, we just exposed these brain organoids to the Zika virus. You had Zika virus in your lab? I do, yeah. Do, do yeah. we have to worry? Are we <laughs> no, okay? No. Yeah. They're under control, yeah. Right. But, but you're studying the virus so that you can help people in real life who get infected with this and understand what happens to their brains. I've seen children with microcephaly and the ocular complications of Zika. Yeah. It's real, it's sad, it's devastating to the family. If you're not doing that research, we don't ever get answers. Right, right. And I think one of the coolest thing is the fact that not only we learn that the Zika was the causative agent uh, for this outbreak, but we could also use this to, to screen drugs that inhibits the replication of the virus. So in record time, we now have drugs that if there is a new outbreak out there, we could give to pregnant women that um, will not pass the virus uh, to the babies, so we can save the baby's life. That is a great example of laboratory research affecting the way we, we take care of patients and impacting and to prevent a child from having a Zika virus infection is enormous. Yeah. It's devastating when those occur. And so uh, that, that's, to have that have happened this quickly is unbelievable. Right. We, we, uh, uh, we've talked to people who've been studying diseases here for 30 years and don't have answers. Exactly. Yeah. So for you yeah. to have an answer that quickly is, yeah. is, is close to a miracle. Yeah. So I want to go back to your brain organoids. You're watching these mini brains, how they develop. What kinds of things in real life, like we talked about Zika, where development goes wrong, mm -hmm. do we see happen 
that you may be able to look at and start getting a sense of what you can do to make a difference. Yeah, so this was a very good tool uh, to look for brain alterations that you can actually see it. For example, if it's a macrocephalic uh, brain, small volumes, you can, you can figure out how to block the Zika, or if it's a genetic manifestation, uh, you could find drugs that can prevent that. Um, but there was a recent breakthrough. Um, so last year, we learned how to grow these organoids to create functional neural networks. So that's one step ahead. So now, so now we have to explain what the neural net, the functional network is. Right, a functional network is when neurons start to talk to each other, and and, and form uh, uh, complex uh, nets of information. So that's how um, our beginning of our cognition appears or, or arises in, in the early stages of neurodevelopment. Um, so so the baby doesn't have all those connections. The baby already have them, but they are not mature enough. And uh, in the organoid, we never seen that before because we thought that it would be impossible to recreate that in vitro. Uh, and a brain organoid has uh, intrinsic limitations. It's not vascularized, not all cell types are there. We don't even know if the conditions are the same condition as uh, in, in uterus. So we were quite skeptical that the networks would appear in these brain organoids. But um, so science has evolved uh, to the point where we, we could tweak this protocol and make them actually form these networks. So now we open the possibility to study conditions where the brain is intact, but the networks are not. For example, uh, conditions like uh, autism or schizophrenia. Um, so we don't see a major neuronal loss or a neurodegeneration in autism or schizophrenia. But the network. But the network is defective. So the question is, can we use these brain organoids to find new drugs or, or eventual gene therapy um, to help people with this kind of neurological conditions? So understanding normal, how it, how it works, how it's supposed to work, helps you identify what to do in uh, situations where it didn't work the way we want it to work. Exactly, that's, that's, that's how we do it. We always uh, compare the disease condition with the neurotypical. That's what we call disease modeling in a dish. So we're, we're doing this right now. I, I remember years ago I met an Indian sitar player and he gave me music to play for my children. And, he, and I said, why shouldn't I listen to it? And he said that I, I never developed the neural connections to hear all the sounds because those were not made when I was a baby. Mm -hmm. And when I can make those networks, you speak Portuguese and the sounds, I have to concentrate very hard to hear all of that. Uh -huh. But your neural network was exposed to that and it was reinforced and created. So you're now looking at these kinds of networks that babies, uh, that's how they learn and grow yeah. and being able to develop them in a lab. So I, that's, it's just to me amazing yeah. uh, that, that you're able to do that in a laboratory. And I think you now touch on, on, on other things which, which my, um, uh, uh, be a little bit more complex. For example, uh, we could use the same technology to make uh, the same human brain um, uh, more plastic or more adaptable or have more synapses or be more protective against neurodegeneration later in life. Would be nice to have a brain that is protected against Alzheimer's. Yes. So we can, we can ask those questions and perhaps find the answers. And, um, and, and some of these answers might require early modulations of these networks at very early stages in development. So we, as a society, we have to discuss the ethical implications of those um, alterations. Uh, you know, as, as a parent, that's a, that's a tough question to think about, uh, and in society, that, that's a tough question. I don't think we'll answer that today, but, <laughs> but it's an important question because science is about to give us those options, right? Uh, and and sooner rather than later to decide that. Uh, I, I'm a op pediatric ophthalmologist. Uh, we have children of amblyopia that really can't be treated after you get older mm -hmm. because the neuroplasticity is gone. Right. Uh, there are brain injuries that we'd love to be able to repair. I mean, th there's so much that we'd want to be able to do that you could see you making a difference in. Yeah. So you're going to fix everything. That's, that's <laughs> now you you before as we sat down, you mentioned uh -huh. that the, your brain organoids are going up in the space shuttle? Right. Why? Well, I mean, they're going to the International Space Station. And uh, so this is um, one of those experiments that is uh, high risk, highly exploratory. 
and uh, we are trying to answer three questions with this experiment. The first one is um, a, a bioengineer question. Can we create a platform to grow these organoids in an autonomous fashion? Right now I have students, postdocs, and technicians in my lab taking care of them, and they have to look how they look like, uh, feed them, make sure that they, 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 they are happy. Um, so we want to create a, a, a robotic platform so this would be done in an autonom autonomous fashion. So that was the right excuse to work on a platform like that. So the second one is, um, can we take advantage of um, uh, this experiment to learn something about how the normal human brain develops in, in microgravity? So why this is important? Well, I mean, if you are thinking about um, colonization of other planets, if you're thinking about living in Mars, uh, it means that uh, the human uh, species would have to reproduce over there. Um, but we have no idea how the human embryogenesis will happen. So by learning how the human brain evolves or develops in microgravity, we can gain insights about um, uh, is it viable, is it possible, um, and if not, how can we mitigate eventual problems? So we anticipate that uh, cells in microgravity might replicate a little bit faster. So if that's the case, uh, the human brain will evolve quite fast in uterus, and we might have a problem for uh, normal delivery. So it means that a pregnant woman in space will probably have to go through a C-section. If the because brain the skull would be bigger, because the brain would be bigger. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's so, you know, in all this, I'm a science fiction fan. All, uh, I don't remember reading about this as a potential problem in science fiction. You're now exceeding science fiction. You know, that's the funny thing because, I mean, similar to you, I love science fiction and I have been uh, reading about, yeah, human species, colonization in other planets. It's fascinating. Well, but nobody asks if the human biology is ready for that. Yes, <laughs> it, that's, but now you're starting to ask we that question. We're starting to ask those questions, yeah. Uh, incredible, and um, there was, a, was that the, the three things? Oh, and the third question is, uh, can we take advantage of this environment uh, in space to create a better model for some of the conditions here on Earth? And I'll give you an example. Um, if you go to uh, the space and stay in space for a while, your cells not only will replicate faster, but might senesce or age a little bit faster. So it might wow. be that uh, brains in the space station could be a good model to study Alzheimer's disease or conditions that um, the symptoms appear really late on life. So we are taking advantage of that environment to really age the organoids so we can study them better. I would never have thought of that. That's a, it's very clever and, and very bright. Um, I, a few more things I want to make sure that we talk about. Um, I saw that you were working on looking at the parts of our DNA that people would call junk DNA. Right. And what happens and why that occurs. So let, let's explain what junk DNA is and then what you've been looking at. Right. So um, the human genome uh, inside of each cell contain uh, lots of information. The information that we use to code uh, proteins or to code information to have the cells uh, uh, living and, and executing all the functions, it's about 1 or 2% of all the DNA that's inside. So what are the other 9, 8% of DNA? So uh, since we don't have a function for them, we used to call them junk DNA. So that's where uh, the term comes from. But more and more, we are learning that inside that junk DNA, there are um, uh, uh, sequences or instructions that are important for the cells as well. We just didn't know it. Um, and also inside of this junk DNA, uh, it is a structure that uh, resembles a retrovirus, a virus that uses RNA to replicate itself. But it's an endogenous retrovirus. It never leaves the cells. It's almost like um, it's parasiting the cells. It stays in there. And um, what we learn uh, through the years is that when you induce the stem cells to become neurons, not skin, not gut, not pancreas, not liver, but brain, these endogenous retro elements become alive and they start to be jumping around <laughs> our cells. Yeah. Which is unknown why, but, but it happens. Yes, exactly. We know the phenomenon is there. We know it happens. There's been uh, many confirmations. It's an interesting phenomenon. We don't know why. All right, so the next time I have you on the show, I'm gonna, that's the first question I'm going to ask you, and I bet you'll have the answer by then. I hope so. <laughs> yes. Um, you've also been looking at 
uh, how autoimmune diseases can affect neurotransmission, et cetera. And I think that that was fascinating, our own body interacting with disease. Yeah. What have you yeah. been working with that? That was one of uh, uh, the situations where, uh, by studying these retro elements or endogenous retroviruses in the genome, uh, we realized that uh, once they are accumulating inside the cells, uh, the cells uh, feel that they are being attacked by an, uh, an exogenous virus. It's almost like they are being infected against something, but they are not. It's just like their own endogenous virus. And by doing that, they create some kind of autoimmune response. They trigger a pathway that called the interferon pathway, which is a, a, a signal to the body that I'm being attacked by a virus. And the body responded to that. And in situations like uh, Icardi Gutierrez syndrome, right. um, we have this uh, uh, reaction from the body, even in the absence of uh, an endogenous virus, uh, 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 exogenous virus attacking the, uh, the environment. So it, it just opened or revealed itself as a, as a new therapeutic opportunity. Now we are uh, discussing the use of antiretroviral drugs to treat conditions like this one. So it, it, we mentioned this earlier, and I want to make sure we talk about it again. It sounds like you're doing this fancy, in-depth science in a lab somewhere far over there, but you're standing right next to the hospital and, and where <laughs> you want to get treatment to be able to get to, to folks. I mean, there, there are doctors who take care of patients with Williams syndrome, with autism, right. with all these different problems, and you're, they've been looking for answers. Yeah. And, and so your lab is, is the kind of place where they get those answers right. eventually. Right. Right. So the value of being in an academic medical center, of having this kind of scientific research, uh, it's, it's invaluable. Yeah, yeah. And there is another thing also. I think in the beginning of my career, I had a very academic perspective of science. I was interested in these uh, deep fundamental questions and not really worry about their potential applications. But now I have a son with autism, and that changes my life. I want to translate what I know from the lab to the clinics. And being in uh, this kind of uh, environment here at UCSD, where it's highly collaborative, I think allows me to go faster to the clinics. It sounds like you're not gonna be very patient. You wanna get there quickly. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So in the few minutes we have left, tell me about the future. You can do science fiction if you like, but I mean, where is this gonna go? What would you like to see your lab doing and, yeah. and take us through it, the world according to you? Right, I think um, uh, the brain organoid protocol that we have right now, there is room for improvement. Um, after nine months or 40 weeks, uh, the electrical activity from these organoids plateaus, and we don't quite understand why. We think it is because it's lacking input and output information. So right now we are trying to uh, induce um, uh, some uh, stimulation to these organoids to see if they can further mature. And we are doing this in different ways. For example, we collaborate with other people uh, who can create uh, models, for example, uh, the optic uh, uh, nerve or, or retinas and try to connect the brain with these uh, artificial retinas as well and perhaps stimulating the retina would uh, induce some kind of plasticity or maturation in the brain. That's huge from a vision standpoint. Um, this is definitely one thing that we're moving forward. Uh, there are other sensors that we can add to the organoid, and at one point, going more towards the science fiction, we thought, well, why don't we just give them like an entire body? <laughs> and, and, and we thought that, um, well, this can be done by transplanting them inside an animal, but then you have no control how they will self-organize. Uh. But we thought, alternatively, why don't we uh, connect them with a robotic platform? And having these organoids control a robot, and having the robot exploring the environment to retrofeed back into these organoids. So this is, um, is not like that far out. We are actually doing this right now. No, it's like our brain, and, and we have touch and smell and, and vision that are giving stimulus back to our brain. Yeah. You want to create that robotically. In the, that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I ask all researchers this question. How do you get funded? How do you have the money to do this? Now, that's a very important question. Uh, my lab is funded uh, uh, about 30% through the NIH. Uh, about 30% is coming from uh, CERM, California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. Uh, and the other 30% I account for um, 
philanthropic donations and uh, foundations uh, for specific diseases. So that's more or less how my, my lab is funded. So when people give money to these philanthropic organizations and they distribute it, these are, you're one of the people that are making a difference that that money goes to. So, I mean, it's another pitch for why it's so important to support this kind of research. Without that, your lab doesn't function. Absolutely, absolutely. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming and spending this time with us. It's, I, I, I was so excited to talk to you and, and you have not failed us. You know, this is, this is truly science fiction being put into action. So thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you for, for having me, thank you. My pleasure, and, and thank you for listening. This has been uh, another episode where knowledge is power but it's another expert that's come on our show that's demonstrated why research in the laboratory is so important to making a difference for humans in real life. You can support that through your philanthropic efforts and it's important that you do so because otherwise this doesn't happen. I'm Dr. David Granite and we'll see you again next time right here on Health Matters.